Assalamu alaikum, greetings, welcome everyone. My name is Saqib, your host on the Hikmah Project podcast, and today we'll be speaking to Imam Abdul Karim. And uh, I was very fortunate to visit the Farm of Peace in Pennsylvania, uh, where I met him and got to know him and invited him to do a podcast. He was uh, born and raised in the Bronx, New York, and converted to Islam in 1999, and then studied Maliki Fiqh with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf at the Zaytun Institute for five years. And during that time, he also visited Muravid Al-Hajj, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's teacher in Mauritania. So he tells us about that. And then in 2009, he... Uh, met his spiritual guide, uh, Sidi Muhammad Al Jamal from Palestine. He is also currently serving as the Imam at the Farm of Peace, and uh, that's where he gives his Friday sermons, lectures, talks, assisting events, etc. He will, inshallah, be running some courses for us on the Hikma project, and so one of them will be on Ramadan and the other one will be on uh, an introduction to Sufism based on uh, the books of Sidi Muhammad Jama. And um, yeah, I think that's it. So without further ado, here's the podcast. A'udhu Billahi Minash Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar Rahmanir Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنا أمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Welcome, Imam Abdul Karim. Thank you for that beautiful recitation. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Wonderful to have you on our show today. Thank you. It's good to be on the show. Alhamdulillah. So, can we start with your journey to Islam? How did you come to Islam? Okay. Alhamdulillah. So about, I'd say, around 22 years ago, mashallah, I was um, working at a, a temporary job in the hospital. And at this point, I was around 19 years old. And I had a job. I also was you know, running crazy in the streets and, and partying outside in the street and stuff like that. And I came to a point where it was weird enough when I was working, I decided that I was going to start uh, <laughs> selling drugs, which is, is just crazy thinking, but it's part of the path and part of my the story. So I was going to start selling drugs and it was my coworker who was actually the one who was going to supply me. He was doing that on the side. And, uh, I got home after work. We, we made the connect to say he was, he was going to bring it the next day. I got home on the way home. I was just thinking about it. Like I hang out, I hung out with drug dealers and I knew how that lifestyle was and the amount of, anxiety and always being on point and, and looking at your head on the swivel, worrying about your friends or so-called friends and people you supply or cops. So it's just, it was a lifestyle that I realized 
one, I had a legitimate job I didn't need. I had two parents that was love that loved me, took care of me, supported me, and I couldn't understand what made me want to do that other than you know the programming. But so I, I made a prayer in the <laughs> funny enough in the bathroom. I remember my head was next to the toilet, and I was like, God, if you just get me out of this, I'll do whatever and whatever you want. And so the next day I go to work. And we're sitting there working. He worked next to me, and we worked the whole day. We get off, walk into the six train, and he said, uh, he tell, he's like, yo, you know the stuff you asked me to bring? I'm like, yeah, he said, somehow um, I forgot it. I just forgot. And so in my mind, that was like the answer to my prayer. I took the thought out of his mind. It was just, I was like, okay, God, whatever you want. And I was so happy when I got home. And then from that point, I was trying to read the Bible from front to back and I always would fall asleep at some point and then a sister I knew because I used to also rap online the sister who you know she liked the, the our, our songs and stuff she was telling me about Islam and you know I said okay I'll look at it but you know I didn't want to hear any more from her because I like looking at things, the sources for myself, not necessarily people telling me. So, uh, she, her, her, her father, her stepfather gave me my first Quran and I took it everywhere with me and I was reading it. Like at that time, that temporary job had finished and I wasn't working. I was just home that this summer. And that whole summer I read the Quran, alhamdulillah, obviously in English from the front to the back. And I just took breaks here and there to play basketball and stuff. But that experience was so intimate because when I explained the difference, I felt when I was reading the Bible, it was like reading a history book. It was read it like in third person. But when I was reading the Quran, it felt like God was talking directly to me, like you, like he was <laughs> speaking directly to me. And so it was just amazing. And so I, I had a few different interactions um, with people that it was like it just and I'll share I guess a few I don't want to make it too long but the I came across one uh, three different groups of people on one one day's journey when I was reading the Quran riding the subway just reading and getting off I was really just like vagabonding but obviously I was going home so I was reading, 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 get off a stop. I was walking around Manhattan, sat down on a bench, started reading. And from the far, you know, Manhattan, well, I don't know, Manhattan blocks are long. So I'm looking down to the corner and I see this guy talking and going up to people talking. And then I see a shirt and it said Jews for Jesus. And I looked, I said, oh, God, don't let him walk over here. As soon as I said that, he walked, he turned, looked directly at me and walked straight to me. And so we had a nice conversation and he posed some questions because I told him, you know, he saw me reading the Quran and he was like, why would you want to read that? You know, I have some friends that are Muslim, but it's violent and all these different things he was bringing up. And I was saying my piece, but he had brought up something and I don't remember what it was, but whatever it was, when we finished our interaction and I went back to my place and reading the Quran, it answered everything he said, like as if, okay, you're back now. Here's the answer to everything you just went through. And that kind of happened two other times with one with my aunt and another with these, I don't know what kind of offshoot Islam they practice, but it wasn't real. It wasn't real Islam. These guys had a book stand on the corner and they were selling these books and it's, it's some sect that was like, it's a whole different Quran where it's like Adam was left behind on a UFO. Like, they, it's weird stuff. And so they was like, oh, you know, your name's Kareem, you know, that's noble and this and that. And I always heard generous. So I knew like some of the things they were talking was there were certain things that were on point because they had books on like the things of the effect of television on you and stuff like that. And then they say, yeah, you know, you should join us. And I say, you know, it seems like we're 
on the same in the same direction, but we're not on the same like wavelength. So I was like, thanks, but no thanks. Then when I went to Quran, it like answered what they were bringing. And then the last one was my aunt was she had said something about, you know, uh, Jesus is, you know, the, the, the mercy comes through Jesus or something like that. And then when I went back to my reading after talking with her, Allah <laughs> said, said like, all mercy belongs to Allah. Like it was just like it answered the doubt that came up. It was like, and so these three instances is like in 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 that whole period of reading the whole Quran, it was things like this that was really strengthening. And I believe once I finished it, it was like, this is the book, the perfect book. And before that, I was reading a book called Path to Perfection. It was a, a Baha'i faith book. And I thought that book was on point. And I remember calling my friend, telling him like, oh, this is the book right here, this book, Path to Perfection. And then I got the Quran and I read, I called them up again. I was like, nah, forget that path to perfection. It's like a watered down version of Islam. And <laughs> so, so we, from that point on, then I wasn't sure. I was definitely sure about the Quran, but it's interesting enough. I wasn't sure about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I got a book of his Sirah and I got to the point of the story of Taif when Allah commanded him to invite the people and they had the beggars and children pelt him with rocks and he left and says, is the, described his sandals gush with blood and he found refuge under a tree and then the angel appeared to him and said you know if you give the command I'll topple the mountain on these people and he said no perhaps uh, believers will come from their loins at that moment, because before my up, my teaching, my I'm not teaching, but my upbringing, my schooling, uh, elementary to high school, and even college yeah, after I didn't go right after high school, was all ca Catholic private school, and so I had a uh, understanding of prophetic character. And when I read that, I just broke, like I was weeping. I cried. I closed the book. I didn't even finish reading. I said I believe, and, and so that that was it. And then I saw, I met some sister online and she told me about a message to go to the make shahada. And alhamdulillah, I went and here we are, like 20 <laughs> years later. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Mashallah, that's amazing. Um, the Quranic verse on Allah brings out people from darkness into the light uh, comes to mind. And just the way he's guided your heart is, is, is very inspiring, mashallah. So then... You went to Zaytuna and you met, met Sheikh Hamza and you spent a number of years with him. Can you tell us about sure. that? Sure. That was interesting because the first cause the first video I watched was Sheikh Hamza and it's Curing the Heart. It was a VHS cassette. And um, that's what I was watching when I was in New York. And, and so this, my Shahada was in August. Um and then I left to go visit California the next year in March uh, because of a sister, which wound up being my my first wife, uh, my ex-wife now. But um, I was talking to her. She was attending Zaytun, and she told me about it. And she mentioned Sheikh Hamza, and I was like, but I had this video. So I said, I'll take a trip out there to see what it's like. And so I went out there in March, and it was just – it was surreal because – when I walked into Zaytuna and I'm laughing because this first uh, uh, event going to Zaytuna to what it became, so what it is now, that's just out of the world. But what it was at that, that time, it was like a small little trailer kind of thing with a, a small a building. And uh, I remember walking in and seeing Sheikh Hamza sitting there. I was like, Subhanallah, like this is not TV. Like <laughs> <laughs> this is he's right there. Like oh, this is not a cassette tape. And um in Alhamdulillah, uh I don't even remember the lesson. I just remember being feeling drawn, like, okay, I, this is where I want to be. And so I moved out there maybe about a month later or maybe in April or May, one of the two, and got married. And from from then started, uh, Sheikh Muhammad al-Yakubi married us. Um, and 
he was he was there. Sheikh Hamza had brought him out. He was teaching class actually the night we got married. Um, and then so I was there from 2000 to 2005 when Zaytuna Institute was in Hayward, California. Now it's in Berkeley at the university. It's a fully accredited college now. But in these days we would uh get together they have classes sometimes the brothers would get together after to do extra studying or to go out and just have fun go to a restaurant or something and that was the, these years was so impressionable to me because it was like the golden expectation so you're getting your sacred knowledge you're you're connecting with other people from various backgrounds. That was the other beautiful thing about Zaytuna. It wasn't just like black, African American, Pakistani, or Afghan. It was a, a tapestry of many different backgrounds and and a, a range of ages. I would say at that time, from like twenty to maybe fifty, and some are older than that. But it was really. Uh, fully a full experience so you got the learning you got the connection with the people and you got the fun times too because we we have fun we play basketball we we some of the brothers we helped uh, at a masjid doing a, a youth study a uh, halakha and so there was no area in my life in this point that didn't include God. So it was like, there wasn't this separation where I'm learning and now I go out into the world and it's just like, here's my sacred and here's my secular. It was all sacred at that time. And, and it was fun. It, it, it just was something that you don't ever really see, especially when they depict like religious experiences or, or in movies and things like you really don't see the humanity of people uh, you obviously see other things, but this was like a real complete uh, picture and experience. And so it really had a deep impact on me. Um, the, the, the teachers that I make that I met, um, Sheikh Salik Ben Sedina, he was a teacher that also I was sit, I sat with for a while. Sheikh Hamza brought him from Mauritania and that was a big experience. Um, Can you, know, you tell us about that? What, what was that like? It was really a huge thing because it was like uh, feeling like how the Sahaba were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because we, you know, I didn't know Arabic. He didn't really speak English at the beginning. and We always had uh, someone to translate. And so there was about, I would say, a good maybe five of us that kind of accompanied the Sheikh all the, all the time a lot. Um, yeah, five or seven of us. And so from having from and that that was towards the last maybe two years. And so this experience was even deeper because it wasn't just sitting in class for the Doris. We would sit in class and there'd be other people who'd been in the classes over. We would take the shake up to around the corner to his apartment and then stay with him, fix food, uh and the lessons continued, not necessarily verbal, but watching how a sheikh is like during all the facets of life. And like uh, one aspect that really stood out to me was the living room. Culturally in our culture, the living room is where the TV is or entertainment. And that's where everybody sits. The li How he had his living room was a bookshelf, carpets, uh, and a rug and he sat on the car he was the center of the living room so when we came in we just it was like how people come in and sit to the tv we sat in front of him and he would just you know either tell us certain things but at that time we would we would <laughs> and it was the other thing we we made we had fun studying because there's a text iman uh, ahdari it's a fifth text and we used to spend the night at the sheikhs and we would call it an ahdari party <laughs> and so we would be trying to memorize the text at night. It was like three or four of us and Sheikh Salah go to sleep and then we would be up either cleaning and then going over the text. And so we, it was an enjoyable on all levels. And so that, that was something that people really don't 
get to experience and 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 even after and the star for love when I moved back to New York after leaving I say I even the lesson I learned was to not always to not make comparisons because I kept the places I was going I was like, oh man this ain't like what I was experiencing in Zaytuna oh, what's this this is not it meanwhile when you do things like that you deny yourself the ble- of witnessing the blessings of what's present because you're comparing to what was, but Allah is always bringing things that you need in the now. And so when I finally let that go and accepted wherever I went and been present there, I was able to one benefit more myself and be a benefit more to the people as well. So, and what about, could you tell us, um, a story or uh, something that you still remember about your meeting with Sheikh Hamza where he, it, it had an impact on you or there was a teaching, you know, element there or. Uh, there's one story that is, is definitely personal, but it's also, it's not even, it's what he transmitted. It really wasn't even what he said. So this mm-hmm. was after nine 11. Um, you know, at that time, Sheikh Hamza, Imam Zay, they were like kind of going around giving talks and like trying to dispel people's fears and things. And and I, I know myself, <laughs> stuff a lot. I was a little selfish. I wanted to get back to learning the fit because that's what we were doing. But it could, you know, such a big event took a pause in in our lessons. And so, long story short. Uh, I was going to different gatherings of Muslims and the conversation that I was hearing, it was like, you know, some conspiracies and different things like that. And I was wondering, I never heard it like, bring it back to Allah, like Allah, you know, all things happen by the will of Allah or different things like that and landing and grounding in Allah. And nobody was really saying that. So it was kind of causing a disturbance in my heart. And I remember going to work, and I just was thinking, 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 and I don't remember specifically what, but I wasn't feeling comfortable. And after work, I was like, I need to see Sheikh Hamza. So I drove out to Zaytuna. And normally, you know, he's there when he's teaching, but you, if it's like hit or miss, if you go there and you, you're not necessarily going to see him every time you go. But I just, I, I drove out there and, you know, mashallah, when I got there, it was around my, a little after Maghrib and they had prayed already. They were uh, uh, a lot of the students, uh, not a lot, but the students that helped in the background were having a meeting in the office with him. And I made my salah and then he was getting ready to leave. And I asked if I could have a word with him for a minute. And I was, I, it, it, I'm talking so calm now, but in this moment I was crying like heavy because Allah like answered the prayer, like I wanted to speak to my sheikh and it was so random of me going there and he was actually there when I got there. It was just like a gratitude to Allah. And so I was, there was a few things weighing on me and I was telling him, you know, nobody's really talking about Allah right now. Like they're just talking about conspiracies and this and that, but then nobody's talking about Allah. What happened to La Hawla Wala Kawata Illa Bala? And I remember I couldn't really pronounce it at that time, but he understood what I was saying. And he said, he said, you know, we need you to be strong right now. And then I had another worry because I guess at this time, a lot of stuff was just coming up for me. And so I was like, you know, because people say I recite good or well, mashallah. And I say, you know, there's a hadith about people who are towards the end of time that they recite the Quran with my little beautiful voices, but it, doesn't go beyond their necks, meaning they don't understand what they're saying. They're just, it's just outward. And I said, how do I not become one of those people? Like I was really worried about it. And, and he just smiled. And this is the part where it's like, it wasn't so much what he said. It was like, just what the transmission, like what just came out of him into me. He just smiled. He's like, don't worry. You know, you're not one of those people. He said, you know, and that's when he was saying, you know, we need to be strong during these times. And he just was building up my confidence. And when and he left, and I think that was right before he left to go to D.C. 
to to meet with the the president or to have a, a talk on that thing. But it was just the timing of how I got there. The meeting ended. He was about to leave. I got and then he left the state. Like it was just a lot allowed me that peace, and and that really had a big. Uh, uh, impact them because it really grounded me. That was the first time that I actually felt unsettled, and the few words in in that that transmission really just soothed my heart. Alhamdulillah. So the whole timing, the synchronicity of the events and the way they unfolded is is one it must show that. So I believe in that time you also went to Mauritania to meet the great Sheikh. Murad Bittal Al Hajj and Sheikh Hamza, uh, I believe, uh, describes him as somebody you know um, from the sixth, seventh century, like somebody who's who's you know you're traveling back in time almost. So, c- could you tell us about what that was and and did you get that feeling? Uh, the Mauritania, yeah. When I was because I went twice. The first time was believe in 2005 and um, it was this experience so you know I met Sheikh Hamza mashallah I met Sheikh Salik now I wanted to see their teacher I said if you guys are this I want to meet your teacher so you know alhamdulillah I got uh, my passport and went out there and I didn't speak Arabic and so this this is kind of the the wildness of this experience is of going to an Arab speaking country. I'm going by myself and I don't speak the language. And so I went out, got to uh, France and Sheikh Salik has sent some books with me to go to uh, the, his madrasa out there. Air France lost them, so to speak. And so, so uh, uh, but when I got to France, I uh, misplaced my connecting ticket. So I'm running around, and then these, I found it. Someone uh, needed to – they had too much luggage, and they needed to – they asked me through translators who were French that didn't speak much English but knew enough. So it was like they were speaking French to them and they were translating. She asked if she could act like she was with me and I and how ha- I'll take the luggage. And I said, okay, sure, because all I had was really like a book bag. And um we get to Mauritania, land is late, it's probably like nine or so it's the night pitch black. And so we get to the airport and the sister who I helped get her luggage there, um Sees, I land. All I had was a small piece of paper with a name, and I didn't know who was supposed to be picking me up or anything. And so she's looking at me, and I'm just like looking kind of dumbfounded. And so she motions me to come over, and she's asking me like, you know, where? And I said, I don't know. I showed her the piece of paper, and then she motions for these two guys to come over, which one was her son and another was her uh, brother, and. We got, she, you know, took me to her house, her family's house. I got in one car with them. She drove off in another in the cab and we got there. They fed me. They, the, the, her father came in. He was a, a hafiz of Quran and he, he came in and he just sat down on the rug and pulled out his Quran and I was just, this whole thing was mind blowing because when I landed in Mauritania and seeing everybody was black, that was just, like it, it, it was a shock to me, and it, it was to see that, and then Muslim on top of that was just like <laughs> <laughs> people. Were like when we were driving after, you know, after this this meeting with this family, they they called the brother who was supposed to pick me up, and they made arrangements for me to meet him the next day. So they let me sleep overnight. They fed me, let me sleep. Total stranger, like from New York. This is an anomaly you would never hear a story it was rare to hear a story like this in new york and so when they connected me with the brother and we're driving and i'm like man we're driving it's a long kifa from nuak shot is a long drive and seeing families stop on the side of the road to make a lot i was like why am i going back to america like, <laughs> <laughs> so but you know alhamdulillah i get the kifa and I see Sheikh Salih's brother, and he looks almost identical, just a little 
heavy of my show. <laughs> and he had pink eye. I get it immediately. <laughs> so it was like I became the 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 specimen in the fishbowl because the kids of the mother, so they were coming in and looking at me and just watching me and it took some time to for me after it cleared up because we got medicine and pink eye cleared up and that's what they were waiting for to send me to Twimret where Marapto Hajj was once it cleared up and that was a like this was a whole like it was not easy and I, I got to find, inshallah, I have a camcorder because I had a camcorder and I almost like did a video journal kind of. Mm. And that was hot. It was the flies. I can't stand fly, like bugs flying around. And it was just, I was like, when am I going to uh, see Sheikh Manap the Hajj? And I was like, Ghadan, inshallah, Ghadan, inshallah. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. Finally, it clears up. We go out there. And after Margaret, we're leaving. We're driving. We take a turn off road now where there's no roads going up mountains. It's all black docks. We catch a flat in the middle of the Sahara and I'm like, oh my God, I'm not getting out this car. Mm-hmm. Alhamdulillah, they fix it. We we got off the track. This brother, because I guess they have like little landmarks that you know where to turn at. And his brother walked, and he had a flashlight on his head. And it looked like he was maybe five steps away. But in the desert, and it being flat and just spacious, it took him like 20 minutes to come back where from where he walked. He was that far away. But the spatial, uh, the way it looked and what didn't look. And so when we he fixed everything, we got back on course. And... Sheikh Adami, may Allah have mercy on him. When we got to Tumret, he's the one that took me in and basically cared for me. So Fajr, he, he was leading Fajr, Zuhur, Asr. And I was waiting for Sheikh Murab to Hajj. I was like, you know, and I've been out there since uh, Fajr. I hadn't seen him. And then Maghrib comes in. Maghrib is so beautiful in the desert because it's nice and cool. There's a beautiful wind and so now the heat is going there's a nice cool breeze going uh the brother's calling the adhan and then out of i don't even know where he came out of out of probably from his hut or the tent you see this older man with his arms on i guess the two sons and they're helping him walk out and subhanallah i I remember thinking like yeah they're helping him walk but he really has this whole village on his back and then once he got closer I just broke out crying like I couldn't control it I don't know what it was I saw him and you know I'm trying to hold it and be tough why are you crying and, and it's, it just I just was crying it was a release <laughs> he led the Maghrib and he salamed out and then I remember he was doing this little dicker to himself, just sitting there, and all these thoughts and vo- in my head, like, what is he thinking? What does he see? How does he do this and this? And then he turned and looked at me, and when he looked at me, it was like I said, it's like a squeegee, just whoosh, all those voices just silence. Everything just went silent, and I just looked down to the ground, like, what was that? And mm-hmm. You know, that was my first meeting of him. And then later, after he went towards where his uh, tent was, he sits out there and people just line up to either go ask him questions, ask for dua. So I went and I asked for dua. Uh, And then the rest of the time I spent with uh, other brothers uh, and another brother from that was out there. I didn't know he was out there, but he was from Zaytuna. And he was out, so he was able to translate for me. And so that was a, a huge blessing that I had no idea he was out there. And and so we hooked up, and he was going over certain texts with me, and then I would sit with Sheikh Adamin, and he would go over certain things, and the brother would translate. How was it like? How is, how is nomadic life out in the desert? How is that, you know? It's hard life, and there's parts of it that's easy because it's, 
it's not all this red tape that we created in our societies, but it's hard because of the, like the physical aspects of it. Mm -hmm. like, and so like, I, I, one thing that was, I found that I liked actually was a bucket shower, like a shower <laughs> without the shower, just washing with a bucket yeah. and out in the area. It just felt so refreshing and making mm -hmm. woo outside and, you know, just, refreshing but the 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 sun oh god yeah that the second time <laughs> i went to mauritania i didn't think about it. the first time i believe it was more like fall because it had rained a little bit but the second time i went it was in the summer that was a whole different experience <laughs> i was drinking pitches of water and that's actually how i got sick i believe i was guzzling the water like crazy and then i wound up getting sick but that life is that was the first time I'm having milk right out of a cow too. And at that time, that was another thing I'm, I, w I was lactose intolerant. And so when they came, they came with this big bowl of milk freshly out of the cow. And I didn't want to like say no. So I was like, okay, Bismillah. And I drank it. That was the best milk I ever tasted. It was warm. It had a slight sweetness to it. It was just very, uh, satiating. And, and so, yeah, that and and the the cooking of the they had this one brother had made a goat. I had goat snout. Like just seeing like you cook everything, you don't waste anything, and it mm. it's, it's a beautiful experience. I, I think, especially for myself, growing up in a place like New York City, the Bronx, and hanging places in Queens. And I was like, man, we thought we was tough. <laughs> like, mm. This is a whole nother level of toughness because <laughs> it, it definitely takes uh, some strength to be in the desert. And I think that's a, a blessing, too, because there's many lessons that you can get from desert living. Just like I think there's lessons that if people have a level of consciousness, you can get from street living, too, if you get out of it, like looking at mm. it from afar. Wonderful. And then you met your spiritual guide, Sidi Muhammad Jamal, in 2009. Um, what happened there? How did you meet him and how did you know he was your guide? And So this what... is interesting. Um, when I first took Shahada, I had uh, was reading from his work on SufiMaster.org. Because the first books that I picked up were, I had were Sufi, Sufism books. Um, the Seeker, Seekers of the Truth, that's an Idri Shah book. Uh, Purification of Imam Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jalani, Allah have mercy on him. The, there were Sufi books, and, and, and this website had stations of the heart, the nafs, the secret, the soul, and I was reading it. It's not on there anymore, it's in his books, but I. That's I was I remember one time specifically reading all the stations, and now it took me one night because it took until Fajr. I remember the sun had rose, and when I was in California, I didn't stray all the way, not straying, but I I kept in contact with the teachings of that site, and I didn't know that the the Tarika actually had a land. Uh, the land up in Northern California. But so when I went to New York, I was looking for Zikr circles because, you know, we did Zikr and, and uh, Pasidas and Zaytuna and stuff like that. And I would, didn't find anything like that when I moved back to New York. So I was looking, I found something on this meetup group. And when I got to the beloved's house, there's a picture of city on the wall. So I'm like, how do you know this man? Like, cause I see his picture on the website and, and for all I knew, he was just in Jerusalem. Like he never came to the States and he goes, Oh, that's my shake. Like, are you, what? How you, how is he your shake? Like, is this, this white guy, and the, the shake from Jerusalem. So I'm like, what is this? And so he said, yeah, he comes to the States. And that's when I was like, he comes to the States. I said, where? And he says, Oh, this farm out in Pennsylvania. And so I said, when? And he said, oh, it's Labor Day. He comes every Labor Day. They have this thing, Sufi school out there. Said, okay, that's it. Once he told me that, I was target <laughs> acquired. <laughs> <And so laughs> I was focused on getting to the farm. 
when they was having the Sufi school. And so, oddly enough, I was moving at that time. Me and my my now my wife, we, our family, we were moving into the apartment I was born into in the Bronx. My family still had it. So we were moving in. And I pushed the last box of our stuff in the apartment. And then I said, okay, so I'm like, I went, I left it to go to the farm. <laughs> so I pushed the box and on the way to the farm, I get here and the brother had told my wife when we, he was telling us about the farm, he said, oh, you know, the place is kind of rustic. I don't know how, you know, what kind of accommodations you're used to. And I was laughing. I was like, I've been in the Sahara. <laughs> Yeah, you can't get more rustic than that. <laughs> so, yeah. so when I got here, I was like, oh, man, this is beautiful. I'm taking pictures. I'm sending it to my wife. And she's like, that's not bad. That's not bad. <laughs> I said, I could have <laughs> went. I said, yeah, you would have loved it out here. And so uh, I see this car coming up around, going to the teaching barn and the city. And he's going to be giving a dar. So I get to the front of the teaching barn, stand outside the, the door in front of the walkway. So he gets out the car and he's walking with his cane and he comes up to me, he smiles and he, he looks at me and says, I've been waiting such a long time. And then just gives me this hug and I hug. And that, that, that experience, like just like, I don't, I don't know. Like that, that, that was just such a, a surreal moment. I don't even think I went in for the darts. Like he walked in <laughs> and I think I just was standing there like, cause fr from the teachings, when I went through it on the website, I was like, this is my shit. Like this is who I want to, but he's not around. So, but once I found that he actually came here and then meeting him. And then that day I took Bayer and, you know, I sat in some of the lessons and for the rest and then, from that point on, we kept coming to the farm every year until now that we hummed a lot move. We live here. <laughs> so, no, no, no. Mm. so what? how was it like? Did you get the impression you, you, you had met a saintly man and, you know, did you see his light? I mean, how how is it different to, say, just meeting an elderly man who was just generous and kind? It's feeling like it's this you it's a feeling of peace and safety like in their presence mm -hmm. and, and strength also and it, there's a a part of you that you turn into a child like out of admir not yeah admiration the love that flows like because i said there's no city and statement of the hajj may allah have mercy on both of them to me, the meeting them was such a gift, and the experience almost mirrored each other in how I felt in their presence. Mm. Just the peace. It, it, was, it was just a connection, a real deep connection. Like sometimes you can meet a brother one time, and like I remember I met a brother once when we met and I said, I don't know, but my soul feels like it just knows you. And we and from that meeting, we've had a great relationship ever since. And it's just like with with men of that caliber, you feel a connection and, and just a peace in their presence that is different than anybody else. And you mentioned how you're drawn to the teachings. Um, what was it about the teachings that really sort of drew you? One teaching uh, understanding of, of Adam, alayhi salam, and the story, and I had this understanding, and I wasn't any, I'm not a scholar, I don't consider myself a scholar now, but I was just learning, and this understanding I had that, you know, when Allah forbade Adam from eating from the tree, and he ate from the tree, I had an understanding, and this was also, you know, me at this period was coming out of Christianity and, you know, where it's, you know, original sin and Jesus, all this other stuff, where this understanding was, no, this, he ate from the tree, but it was also, it was destined for him to eat from the tree. And the, the, he explained also the presence of shaitan in one of the teachings. 
I had said something like, the devil is like the, this is obviously, I didn't have any studying, but I said, the devil is like the guard dog of a lot, like the garden, rather. I won't say a lot, the guard dog of the garden, because if you get caught by him, if you're not pure enough, you're not going to be able to pass through. And there was a teaching that he said he bleaches a pure fire and he's a fire outside the garden. And to go through the fire in order to enter the garden, he'll catch you by any impurities and turn you away. And the understanding where, yes, Iblis is like, he's our enemy, and but he's not the enemy of Allah. Like, Allah doesn't have an opposite. And yeah. that it, he plays a role. And so the way the teachings melded these understandings and then the love, the understanding of love, that component of compassion and mercy was in such a way that I haven't ever experienced before. And so that's what and I was like, because I remember too, and this is some weird, uh, I took a rock when I was, because this is before I took Shahad and I was reading Sufi Master and I was like, I took a rock where I lived in the Bronx. We were right next to the Hutchinson River. And I said, because it was just, you know, everything records everything I was learning. So I took the rock and I said, I want to be a part of the religion of love for the rest of my life. And then I threw it into the river. And it was just like, why I did that, I remember my thought process was, I want this to be my testimony on the day of judgment. And this rocket is going to bear witness to it. Mm. And, and so then being in his teachings and how he immerses love in everything, I knew that this, this, that was it for me. Uh, so, so what's all this love about? Where, where does this come in and how did he manifest it? So the love is the, the essence of reality. Like when we, the love is what drives us to do what we do. And our goal is to direct that love back to Allah because it really comes from Allah to us. And our purpose is to return it to Allah. And so this love is Allah created us not out of necessity, out of a pure choice there was nothing obligatory on us he created us out of his love to be known and so love is the most important aspect because when we understand when we have the love behind what we do and it beautifies our actions and so this oftentimes why people are kind of either in rejection of the concept of love or it's not really uh, focused on in religious discourses because people often confuse romanticism for love and you know love is something that is beyond intellect it is is something that you know people say it will drive someone mad because they're driven by the love but the love for Allah is grounding us in the reality of what we're experiencing in the now. So Allah is creating us now. It's not like he created us a time ago and now we're just ticking on our own. He's creating us and sustaining us every single moment. We're a new creation every moment. It's like almost if, I don't know if you know those, what do they call it? The old picture shows or the stick books where you would, flash the uh it would be like stick figures on one thing and you flash the you flip the pages and it animates yes yes that's almost like what we are every moment is a created created like my hand moving is constant creation in every mm. moment it's not just this hand was created and now i'm moving and know a lot mm. every act is a lot and so this love connects us to the present and to the presence of the present, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so without the love, we when we look at legalistic or legalisms without having that love infused in it, we remember the law without the lawgiver. And so the, the, the law is important in our walking to the lawgiver 
but the law is not the goal, it's the means to the source. And so oftentimes people confuse the law as the goal. And so, you know, it 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 becomes a, a shell. Mm. It's just an appearance. You're not moved because like even in the instance when I said I prayed by with my head by the toilet, like you're not supposed to pray in bathrooms, but we're talking about a lie. So uh, Fick teaches us uh, the outward modalities, but it doesn't teach us what Allah, like if Allah accepted the act or not. Mm. So we we know what position to have our hands or where to, how to bow and ruku and sajda, but where is our heart in the moment? We may have the perfect form, but we might be, you know, Allahu Akbar going to Ruku and it's like, man, what am I going to eat? Mm-hmm. So like that, that's, that's not complete. There's a deficiency there. But when you come to Salah out of love, out of a yearning to Allah alone, that dispels other than Allah from penetrating your Salah. And it's a hard thing. Like these are the easy things to say, but very hard and it takes work. And But it's a blessing the journey to the arrival is the blessing. And so love is a huge component. And, and if I say love, if we can understand it as Allah's embrace, then we would, because many times when we define love, we come out of the love because when we define it, we tell ourselves, if this thing isn't there, then we're not in the love. Because this is how I define love. But if we understand love to be what is, Hmm. we're never out of it. So it it also protects us from the shaitan, waswas, that's like, oh, you're bad, Allah doesn't love you, Allah's punishing you, you're wrong. All of those things kind of fall to the side. And you realize you want to do the actions that Fik is calling us to, out of gratitude to Allah, out of your love and longing to know Allah. And then it moves beyond the fic because now you're in a dynamic living connection and Allah gives from whatever he feels, whatever not feels, whatever you need in the moment. Mm. And that can't be done by anyone else. And so, being in the connection, you will have a, a level of awareness and receptivity to recognize what Allah is giving you in each moment. Subhanallah. Wonderful. So on that note, Imam Abdul Karim, I believe you're planning to run two courses on via the Hikmah project. So can you tell us? About that one is an introduction to Sufism based on Sidi's book. Yes, so that book, that's the introduction to Sufism is based on Sidi's book, Walking the Path of Sufism. And so in this book, it kind of goes from uh, traditional elements of Islam, like the Madhabs, where Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, uh, Imam Ibn. Ahmed ibn Hanbal, uh, what they said about Sufism. So it's, it's showing you that there is a connection between Islam and Tasawwuf. Like they're not, there's not a separation really. Yeah. And, and it really gives a, uh, a taste of the love and how it connects to like Islamic legal actions different uh, blameworthy qualities of the heart that we want to purify ourselves and certain praiseworthy qualities. It contains many different hadith and commentary. And so it's, it's a real, especially from someone who already may be familiar with Islam, yeah. it, gives, it gives it in the light of uh, Sufi principles, understanding and the love that I think would be more palatable to someone who has somewhat of an Islamic understanding because it connects terms that we're used to hearing 
yeah. with the, the love understa- understanding. And so I think it's a good introduction. And for someone who hasn't had a, a, a so-called like an Islamic background or understand a Muslim upbringing that inshallah in in the teaching of the course there's there's the connection where you don't have to have any frames of reference yeah. from from the dars itself inshallah you'll you'll have what you need to to have the understanding or basic understanding inshallah. wonderful and the second course about yeah. ramadan the ramadan course inshallah will be offering little nuggets here and there of wisdoms attributes of Allah and certain practical things that you can do to benefit during Ramadan and enhance your connection with Allah, inshallah. That's wonderful. Thank you, Sidi. It's wonderful talking to you. And if I can ask you kindly to end with a prayer in your beautiful voice. Um, and we really look forward to running these courses on Hikmah with you. Alhamdulillah, sure. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a blessing to have this opportunity. Okay. Actually, can I humbly request um, a salawat or? Alhamdulillah, that's to me. That's that's. I tell people salawat is the cheat code to Allah. Like <laughs> I, I also have, and you you hear in some of my discourse, I have a background in gaming, and so unfortunately, but mashallah. So I say it's a cheat code because. The, the 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 salawat is an act of Allah, as we know from the Quran. It's an act of Allah. It's an act of the angels, and Allah commands those who believe to engage in it. So when you're in, when you're doing it, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam returns it multiple times, so it's. I explain it like I say, you know, the 4th of July, how the fireworks and stuff. I said, Salawat is like a light show because it's just mm-hmm. from Allah, the angel, yourself as in obedience to the command. And then the Prophet saw some responding with even more abundance of the salam. It's just, it's the easiest way to bring sweetness to your heart and sweetness in your relationship with Allah and other beloved. So, alhamdulillah, I, I'll do a Short salawat. Salawatun taibatun lil habib alay muhammad. 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 Salawatun Salawatun taibatun lil habib alay muhammad Salawatun taibatun lil habib alay muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Alhamdulillah Oh Allah we turn to you in gratitude to all that you've bestowed upon us. We ask your forgiveness when we fall into error. We ask that you increase us in our knowledge, increase us in our capacity to receive and give love, mercy, and compassion in your name. Increase us in our sincerity and allow us to taste the sweetness of our faith in this life and the next. Amen. <laughs>